Welcome back everybody. In this video we're going to go a full diagnostic and fixing of an S17 Plus board. So if you got uh, a board that is showing zero ASICs, I'm going to show you how to fix it right now. Um, what you're going to need is very much like my S17 Pro video. So you're going to need a jumper. So again, these are just multimeter probes with a uh, alligator clip cable in between them. And you're gonna need a tester, uh, like this one. I'm using that one, but if you wanna use a universal one based on a minor control board, that also works. Okay, so let's talk about what we're gonna do. So this board is complete, okay, that's not a, a shipping damage board, but it's still showing zero e six. Uh, so we don't have any clue at all of what's happening or where it's happening. So what I like to do first, uh, in order to figure out where the chain is broken, because chances are it's still a chip problem, right? It's very unlikely that it's a, uh, a power problem or a control problem. Most boards uh, have chip problems, like 90 to 95% of boards. Okay, so we're gonna be looking for a break in the ASIC chain. So we know on S17 Plus, this is our chip number one, and then it goes uh, one to five in the first domain, and then over like this, and goes on back and forth. Okay, so this is our chip number one. So what we need to do, is uh, cut the chain at a certain point so that we can test the part of the chain from chip number one to whatever chip we decided to cut the chain at, okay? So in order to be as efficient as possible, uh, we are going to leave as many of the heat sinks on as possible and hopefully be able to access all the test points. So what I like to do uh, when I first assess a board is to use the test points that are on the edge here. Just, uh, you got your five test points every time the, the traces turn around. You have five test points there, and so I like to use them to at least uh, have an idea of where to look. So let's do that right now. Let's go to the microscope and I will show you what I mean. Okay, so here's the corner of the board. So this is chip number five, and just over there is chip number six. And between the two, you can see that uh, the traces are going around, right? And so this is the five test points that I was talking about. So these are all nice and accessible. Uh, you don't need to move any heat sinks or any of that. So I am going to use that uh, to get an idea of where the chain is broken. So back to the overhead. So we got some test points after chip number five, we got some after chip number 15, we got some after chip uh, 25, 35, 45, and 55, right? So uh, maybe you've seen the service manual and you've heard of the dichotomy technique, dichotomy. Uh, that just basically means always cut your board in half and then from there you cut the non-working part in half, and then you go in half again, and, and so on and so forth. So that basically allows you to uh, to do as little iterations as possible, like as little testing as possible to go to your problem area, okay? So, so you know, we got 65 chips. We got a, a very accessible test point at 35, so let's go ahead and use that. So back to the microscope. So again, this is let me just find where we are, right here. So this chip uh, is 35, and then if we go around, then it's 36. So what I'm gonna do is take my jumpers and put one probe in the RO test point, or the RI of chip 35. I'm just try, try to get out of your way, there you go. So this is the RO, of this chip, which is chip 36, which is also the RI for input of chip 35. And so I got my jumpers right now, and so I'm gonna inject 1.8 volt, which is this side of the bottom capacitor. Okay, so let me fire up the test and quickly come here. Oh, board not connected. Yep, we gotta connect our board, turns out. So. Okay, let me just connect my power supply. There we go. All right, let's try that again. So I am going to pull the 
RI, fire up the test, and then go get the 1.8 volt. And we got zero still. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the test now so that the board doesn't get too hot, but. So what does that mean? So we tested at 35 and we still had zero. So that means that there's an issue between chip number one and chip number 35. So now we can divide that half in half, right? And of course, because we're using those test points that it's not exactly in half, but, uh, and in fact, there's only two other test points that we can easily uh, access. So five is a little bit too, uh, too much on the beginning side of the chain. So we got either, you know, 25 or 35. Uh, sorry, uh, 15 or 25, right? So we tested at 35 and then we got either 25 or 15. So let's do the same thing. And let's pick, let's say, so this is 25. Okay, so I'm gonna put it in the middle. Sorry, I'm just a little bit out of focus here or out of frame. Right, yeah. sorry, left hand. There we go. And then fire up the tester and then get the 1.8. Still nothing. Okay, so we're gonna move down one more. So right now we are at 15. Still nothing, so let's move down one more. And then we go, we got our five. So, sorry, I'm a little bit out of focus here. So we got our five. So just to make sure I didn't mess up and didn't have proper contact or anything. I'm gonna go here to here. Oh, there we go. So yeah, I did have a bad contact. So 15 works. Let's move up. Okay, so 15 works. 25 does not work. So we know that, right? Okay, so if you, quick recap. So we tested 35, which is halfway down the board here, didn't work. Then I went down this way, didn't work. I finally got to five, got something. Uh, tried 15 again, got something the second time because I didn't have the a proper contact the first time around. And then 25, nothing. So 15 is good. 25 is not good. So we know that the problem is between 15 and 25. So let's cut that in half. So that means we're gonna try to go for 20. Uh, okay, so let me, right, so those test points right there. So, so this is chip number 20. Sorry, you're all crooked, or I'm crooked, one of the two. There we go. So right now we are at the other end of the board, and this is uh, chip 20, and this is chip 21. So if we cut, if we inject 1.8 volt in the RO, uh, right in between those two, then we're gonna be testing the chain up to chip number 20. So there you go, I'm gonna, carefully go into the middle test point and not touch anything else. And as far as the 1.8 volt, let me show you guys. Okay, and now I need to use this same uh, 1.8 volt, which is the one that is after uh, chip 25, okay? so. So we're looking at chip 20, but in order to test the last chip in the domain, which in our case is chip 20, then we need the 1.8 volt from the next domain over. So this is uh, chip 25, sorry, that I'm pointing at under this heat sink, 25, and so we're gonna take the 1.8 volt from that domain, okay? Let's try that again, and again with our other probe, make sure we're not touching anything. And we got nothing at 20. 
so we did so we know we had something at 25 and we don't have anything at 20 so sorry we know we had something at 15 and we don't have anything at 20 so we know the problem is somewhere in between on this domain right here yeah so that's uh, 16 17 18 19 20 so we could cut this domain in half and try it right in the middle here which we can do next so again so this is where accessibility becomes a little bit of an issue. You guys can actually see pretty well, I can't, because there's some weird uh, parallax effect. But I could squeeze in there like so and make sure I'm not touching, uh, like the plastic part of my probe is touching the heat sink right there, but that doesn't matter obviously, like the metal part is what matters. And that is clear of both heat sinks. So I'm again in the middle test point. I'm gonna fire up the tester and get the 1.8 volt from that same domain because we're not testing the last chip in the domain, right? And we got zero. So we know we had 15 and this is after chip 18 right now. So that is not working. So let's go one less. And again, take the middle test point, make sure we get good contact, and then I'm gonna show you guys that I'm taking the 1.8 volt right at that same domain. Nothing again. So I'm just gonna finish that domain right there. And still nothing, so in order to confirm, Let's re-inject that right here. There we go. So we got 15. And I'm really gonna make sure I got a good contact. And um, there we go, zero. So, so we found out where the chain is broken. Does that make sense? So we had something at 15 and nothing at 16. So chip number 16 is obviously suspicious. Now we gotta find out what exactly is going on. If, uh, you know, if the signals are making it to 16 or if 16 is not passing signals or, or whatever else. So let's go back to the microscope again. There we go. So this is our chip number 16. So now I'm going to take my multimeter and I know I have a 1.8 volt going into the chip because I was using it to inject in other places but uh, I'm going to look at, so let's, let's do the full, the full test. So right here 1.8, right here 0 0.8, that's good. Now looking at this guy right here, 0 0.48, there you go. So this is supposed to be 1.8 and let's have a look at the actual 1.8. Uh, yeah, that's good. So we got 1.8 at that capacitor, but if I move on to the bottom capacitor, then 0 0.475 is what it reads. And then if I go back to the input side, oops, I got my 1.798. So got 1.8 volt on the input side and uh, I can't remember what the number was, 0.5 something. So not 1.8 volt on the output side. And so that's telling me that chip number 16, which is this guy is not passing voltage. And so because of that, I know that is bad, so I need to pull the heatsink off and see what I can find. Maybe there's going to be like a big solder ball that's shorting out some pins, or if everything looks okay, then um, the chip is probably going to have to be replaced. So let me disconnect my power supply, just so I can move the board around and be more comfortable. Take my air. 
There we go. Okay, so 5, 10, 15, 16 is this guy right here. I gently tap it, and when I see it move, all right, let's see what this looks like. I think I know it's kind of hard to see with the the reflection of the light in the solder but uh, so there's that one little solder ball at the top there but that's not that's not near the pin so I don't think this was an issue so basically we had our 1.8 volt we had our 1.8 volt on the capacitor here, which is where I was taking it to inject into the test points. And then when I was measuring on this side, uh, I had like 0.4 volts or 0.5 or whatever. So uh, something's definitely going on with this guy. I mean, it doesn't look the best, right? You can see like the corners are uh, lost their copper already. Like the edge here looks a little burnt maybe or, and there's obviously a lot of a lot of dirt and random stuff on the pins, so let's just give that a quick quick cleaning with some alcohol just so we can know for sure that we don't have an issue. And uh, nope, nothing there, so so I'm gonna call it bad chip. I'm gonna go replace it and I will be right back. Okay, here we are. I got my chip uh, ready to go, and this is the the board with the old chip on. And I know a lot of people have been asking about my soldering setup. Uh, it is heated from underneath, and I'm kind of hesitant to show photos or, or videos of it just because uh, you know it's so dependent on the how powerful your air station is, and and you know your work cable and and all, all kinds of stuff. So. But I am going to give you a sneak peek and blow your mind. Are you ready? As I leave the board, whoa, there is an air station. And that is as far as I can zoom, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, you can use your imagination and figure out what a hole in a table would look like. And that is basically it. So I just put the board over it. And uh, let me just make you guys straight and zoom in a little bit back in focus. Okay, so here we go. Let's get to it. And so the advantage of heating it from underneath is that you use the bottom heat sink as like a thermal funnel. So your air station is going to blow air over the whole heat sink and that heat sink is going to, really going to focus the heat on the pad of the chip. And so that makes it, that makes the heat really focused on this one area. You don't need to preheat your board. You don't need to do any kind, any sort of that stuff. And just fire up the air now and you're going to see almost instantly the flux is going to be melting. I get my other chip ready. And only within, you know, less than 30 seconds, then we're going to see the solder is going to become liquid and I'm going to be able to pull the chip from the board. You see it's starting to liquefy right here at the bottom. Now I'm looking at the pins on the sides. They're not, not shiny quite yet. And also another advantage of heating it from underneath is that you don't risk blowing all those small resistors and, and capacitors, right? So 
Uh, of course, there are some other components on the bottom, but basically when, when it's liquid, like right now, you just really have to be careful not to bang the board or as you move it, uh, you just have to be cognizant of that. And basically, uh, the surface tension is going to keep the, uh, the components on there. All right, so here I am lining it up. There we go. And I tap it, tap, tap. And that is solid. So I'm gonna turn off the heat. And have one last look. Be careful what I'm touching right now because everything is melted. And so when I do what I do when I when I tap it, uh, it's just a way for just a way to help the chip uh, find its home, right? And what I mean by find its home is uh, use the surface tension to center the chip exactly where it's supposed to be. So as long as you get it close enough, uh, chances are it's just gonna move on its own and find its home. Okay, so now I'm gonna so it's still liquid, like you can see, and like I said before, um, I can move the board right now, even though some of the stuff is still liquid, but I am going to be very careful. So let's do that, and I'll see you over there. And there you go. That was real time, hopefully. The board, like this edge of the board, is a little hot to the touch, so I can't hold it for very long. But basically, uh, that's what it took to replace a chip. And my microscope is basically set up right between the area where I have the hole in my workstation and this uh, and this area. So it's on a pivot and I just pivot it back and forth. So you can uh, imagine what it looks like maybe. It's basically like right next to my main area. Okay, so let's wait a couple more seconds for the all the solder to solidify and then we're gonna have a look. Okay, so that was literally maybe like a minute. So stuff is still still pretty hot and some of the solder might be a little soft still so I'm just gonna be careful especially around those resistors just gonna get rid of all my flux and I always like to look at my look at my cotton swab just to make sure I don't see like a resistor in there because these things are so small and sometimes it's easy to miss that you ripped one of the board but then if you look in your cotton swab and there's nothing in there then chances are you are good and this looks good I don't see any bridges or any uh, you know any stuff touching all the pads or all the pins look good so now again we're gonna let the board cool off a little bit more because this area is still pretty warm uh, just so we don't get any false results with the tester and then we're going to be back and plug the tester on it and hopefully we made some progress okay board has cooled down let's plug our tester and our negative and our positive let's fire this up see what we got 65 jackpot so we can even let it run for a little bit but so this appears to be fixed so we only had one bad chip um, which honestly I'm not surprised because with boards that uh, don't have like a heat sink falling off problem during shipping so that board was in service and uh, suddenly failed and I'm not surprised that it's obviously just one bad chip because there's only one that needs to fail in order to uh, cause the whole thing to go down. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna write a little blurb on what we just did, like different steps, and I'm gonna put it in the description of the video. And eventually I'm gonna write up a page on the wiki that details all those steps, but, so yeah, so basically find out where the chain is broken, then you find out why it's broken in our case it wasn't passing the 1.8 volt 
and then you fix whatever needs to be fixed. So in our case, the fix was to replace the bad chip. So hopefully you learned something. Um, it, you know, every board is different, but like I said, 95% of them um, is a chip problem. So you should be able to apply that technique to your own boards and hopefully fix them and be on your way. Thanks, have a good one.